Good evening and welcome to the Aspen webinar series. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. This program tonight is brought to us by our friends at Saluda Medical and it will be focusing on Saluda's advanced ECAP sensing and precise neural activation. Dr. Deer, take it away. Well, thanks, Michelle. And, uh, you know, we, we began our webinar series in April of 2020. Uh, that was the first, and it led to a series of educational events. And tonight, another first, uh, as we now see commercial approval in the United States for Saluda's uh, evoke system. Tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about the science. And, and I think as we have new things offered to us, there's two things we should always look at. What's the science and what's the evidence? And that's what we're going to explore over this next hour. We'll be on time. We'll have some time at the end for some questions. And I think you're going to find the discussions really uh, invigorating and really uh, maybe renewing your sense of neuromodulation. Next slide, please. So I'm going to have my faculty introduce themselves. I'll start with Dr. Peterson. Hi, I'm Erica Peterson. I'm a professor of neurosurgery at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, and I'm delighted to be here with you all this evening. Great to see you. Uh, Dr. Hunter? My name is Corey Hunter. Um, I'm an assistant clinical professor at Mount Sinai, and I own my own private practice here called the Ainsworth Institute of Pain Management in New York City. And I just want to say how uh, excited I am that we're, uh, after all these years of me working on this product and seeing the science behind this, to be able to kind of finally see this come to fruition. So glad to be here. Great to have you. Dr. Flowski? Uh, Dr. Stephen Falowski, a functional neurosurgeon uh, in the Philadelphia region, uh, previously in academics for 10 years, now in private practice for three years, and actually been lucky enough and privileged enough to work with the company since its inception and its first ever uh, study that they, they put forth in the United States. So excited that we're finally uh, getting to this point. No, that's great, uh, Stephen. Thank you for that. Uh, next slide, please. So. I, really, I, I want to. We're all working with Saluda as consultants. We were involved in the study, involved in the current study. I think that's important, and uh, we're going to see where we go in the science. Uh, I want to point out this is the first and only FDA-approved system for real-time sensing and neuroactivation, and that's important because I think sometimes it's confusing as a doctor when people say they have closed loop. Only this system can measure every second, multiple times a second, every impulse to your nervous system coming back to the cord and then respond. It's measurement and response. And I think you'll see that in some of our data. And it, it's unique. It's the only system like this, FDA approved. And it's the only system really on the horizon like this. Since no other have been studied. There's been no level one evidence on any other system that can do any of these capabilities. So this is a really a truly unique experience for our patients. And we'll see what the real world data shows going forward if it matches what we're gonna show you tonight. Next slide, please. So we're going to redefine the standard of care in SCS, and there's a long history. You can see on the left-hand side of the slide, the first ECAP was measured in sheep in Australia in 2010, and shortly thereafter, I had the chance to meet John Parker and his team with a, a man named Dr. Michael Cousins, who was a mentor to me uh, in early 2011. And then we saw a human measurement of ECAPs, and then that went forward, the first human implant permanently in Australia in 2015 through European approval, Australian approval, and then this year, after many years of studies and level one evidence, we see the FDA approval in 2022. Now, is this important? Well, there's ways to get, you know, for those who don't know a lot about FDA approval, there's different ways to get FDA approval for a device. The best way, in my opinion, is to do something called an IDE, level one study. Not only was a study done by Saluda so impactful, a unique double-blinded study, the only one of its kind in the field, which we'll hear more about in a few moments, but it set a new standard for research in our field because the two publications we've produced so far from that study have been really published in two of the best journals in the space, the Lancet Neurology Journal, 12-month results, and JAMA Neurology, 24 months. So these two impactful journals, I think, will help us to set a new standard of, of really reaching heights with our field to make us the standard of care throughout the world for patients who suffer. That's our goal, is to become the standard for patients who need us versus things that maybe not be a, as effective, more invasive, or more addictive. Next slide, please. So with that in mind, I've set the tone. I'll be back to see you in about a half hour, but we're going to start our journey tonight with Dr. Erica Peterson talking about really sensing a precise neural activation. Dr. Peterson. 
Thank you, Dr. Deere. So I, I think it's a wonderful introduction. I think one of the most important things that we can talk about is why this is such an important transition. Where we've been in spinal cord stimulation up to this point is in a place where we kind of are working in a black box. We know the device delivers an electrical impulse. That impulse is delivered into some amount of neural tissue. But what the actual effect within the neural tissue is and what the benefit is in terms of our end goal of improving somebody's pain and quality of life has been very hard to measure. Where we are with that is patients tell us, well, I adjust my controller. If it's too strong when I sneeze, I turn it down. If I'm going to go garden and be bending over a lot, I'll turn the stimulator off for a while. So that's a, a way of trying to adjust and maintain feedback, but it's a very inefficient very slow way of doing what really needs to happen real time. These sorts of problems with not having consistency of stimulation based on activity, consistency of benefit, and knowing what, where we are affecting the neural tissue doesn't matter what the target is, doesn't matter what waveform it is. Ultimately, though, what ends up happening is patients come back and say, I'm not getting enough relief. I need another adjustment, I need more programming, and we continue to work on titrating the dosing and the, the settings of the stimulator until finally that patient may approach a failure point. Next slide, there we go. So we, as I mentioned, that can be a few things that contribute to inconsistent activation. It can be physical changes in terms of activity and position, which change the area of neural, neural tissue, which receives a activating stimulus from the stimulator electrodes. Or it can be physiological changes. It can be coughing, sneezing, um, but also things like dehydration, sleep deprivation, even medication effects can change how over time uh, a patient will respond to stimulation even with the same settings. So a static spinal cord stimulator therapy which delivers an unvarying impulse at say a 60 hertz rate doesn't adjust to these real-time neuro neurological realities for these patients in terms of their physiology. What that leads to then is problems with loss of efficacy, which translate into explantation of devices because patients no longer get benefit and become frustrated. It leads to a burden which uh, requires more time for us as clinicians to help patients navigate this titration to failure algorithm of how we approach trying to manage devices. How do we coordinate the patient coming into the office, meeting to readjust with a representative, troubleshooting with additional x-ray exposure? And ultimately, it probably leads patients to stay on higher doses of medication than they'd like to be. We all have patients who find that one of the reasons to have a spinal cord stimulator implanted was to decrease the medication doses that they take. And when that isn't one of the goals that they can accomplish, it becomes very frustrating. If you really want to calculate out what that burden to patients is, think about the time it takes to schedule an appointment, the time to get to the appointment location, time in the waiting room, frustration over time, and you can see how this ultimately leads for people to disengage from a therapy, which might offer them benefit and certainly offer them enough in a temporary trial before we put the permanent device in. Frustration ultimately can act as a nocebo that then further complicates people's confidence in the therapy and, their, and their, loses their commitment to try to optimize. So how are things possibly different? Tim already mentioned this idea of real-time feedback. So the idea here is that the, in, within the same self-contained system, you can deliver a stimulation waveform know what the neural activation is by sensing the evoked compound action potential that is generated and read off of the same electrode and then using the strength of that EKIP signal as a real-time assessment of the efficacy and the need for what the next impulse should be delivered. And then that then influences again what the next impulse is and the cycle continues. What this then leads to is the ability to deliver, first of all, a measured impulse to impulse value for what the neural activation is. 
Now, finally, we have something that is more quantifiable than a patient who says, ooh, that stem is too strong in my leg when I move a certain way. Now we actually can look at the physiological information, quantify what that means in terms of changes in neurological activation. And based on that quantified information, now we also can have a device that's smart enough to sense that and maintain consistent activation despite what the physiological circumstances of the patient are. So neural activation comes down to this idea of a therapeutic window. When a patient is a, set up to have a ECAP-based system program, there are defined parameters. That develops this window of therapy where there's an upper limit beyond which stimulation is intolerable or uncomfortable and a lower limit below which it will be ineffective. The idea then is that within those parameters, the device can automatically adjust to maintain that neural activation signature of the ECAP in order to stay within that therapeutic target range. This is done by looking at what the summation of those action potentials are from the, that are read from the, neur the neural tissue, knowing that the nerve activation area is staying consistent, and the ECAP reading, which you see here as a triphasic wave, is then what verifies and quantifies the efficacy. Now that objective measure is what drives the benefit of the stimulation. What this leads to is again, an instantaneous way where the first stimulus is then sensed and then the, there's an adjustment in the shape and the amplitude of the waveform that's delivered again. This can happen up to 100 times per second in order to make the best optimal stimulation effect with the consistency of neural activation. That's consistency regardless of activity, it's consistency regardless of physiological changes. The idea here is the system should be dynamic enough to keep up and not something that lags by several seconds just by virtue of trying to detect a position change. We're actually looking at the real-time electrical changes in terms of the neural tissue performance and response. So what does that ultimately mean? Well, we're going to hear from Dr. Hunter here in a second about the Evoke clinical study and what the outcomes were. But what we've been able to demonstrate is some of those problems that lead to lack crisis of confidence for our patients in, in use of their stimulators is improved. There's improved durability in terms of in the study population, no explants over two years for loss of efficacy, reduced burden both to clinicians and to patients. The number of reprogramming sessions once somebody is set within a therapeutic dosing window is less than one a year. And that then enables patients to meet their goal of decreasing their medications as well. So I'd like to turn things over to my colleague, Dr. Hunter, so he can tell you more about the clinical research study in more detail. Dr. Hunter? Thank you, Erica. So I'm going to go a little bit into um, this, the evidence now. So the evidence was really kind of in our field was made famous by Kumar. And then it came forward to about 2015 when all of a sudden we had our first like real clinical trial in it. And that was the Senza study. And that really set the baseline, um, you know, to this day for what people consider to be, you know, best in class for literature. So with that in mind, we're going to compare what is the best to what we're presenting today, which is Saluda. So this is going to be specifically about the 24-month data. So 12-month has already been published. Uh, that's what was in Lancet Neurology. And uh, for those of you that don't, are not familiar with it, um, it showed uh, non-inferiority and superiority. Um, and it showed never, never seen before um, results across the board, pain, function, quality of life, opioid reduction. So now we're going to take it out to the 24 months and see how it compares. So if you look, this is the most comprehensive uh, set of data that there is in the market. So pain responder rate, ODI, that's the standard that's been studied, that's been showed um, you know, ad nauseum. Now taking it a step further, opioids, sleep product, or sleep improvement, um, mood. These are things that kind of fall to the back end of presentations and is, you know, for lack of a better word, the fine print. These are things that are important for us um, as you know, real clinicians. Um, when we use these therapies and the patients come back month after month for prescriptions of opioids or still asking for disability letters, it kind of makes you question why you did this. 
um, you know, are the patients really actually getting better? So these are the things that are just as, if not more important than just an arbitrary VAS score. So with that, we're gonna show how this compares to what is the, supposed to be the industry standard or the best in class, which is a census study. So I'm gonna take a second here to kind of go over what this study is. So people are familiar who do a lot of clinical trials or something called the Hawthorne effect, where if a person believes that they're getting what is considered to be the experimental or the uh, variable in the study, that they'll tend to perform even better. So with that in mind, there was never really able to be a, uh, like a true double blind study in this space because people always knew what they were getting. This was the first ever double blind randomized control trial. So the patient didn't know if they were getting open loop or closed loop and the doctor didn't know if they were getting open loop or closed loop. And they would even query us to see um, what we thought the patients had. What this was going forward, patients were allowed to cross over, which is uh, an even a higher benchmark in the study because you can see how patients track between the different arms. And if the patient wants to kind of go forward and you know change, change gears or stay with what they had. So this was 134 patients uh, across 13 clinical sites. I was very much lucky to be one of them. I'm grateful for that. And this was studying a very typical uh, pain population. These are patients that had overall pain. These are patients we see in our practice. These were not cherry picked, um, equivalent to about eight out of 10. So an 80 millimeters of VAS, pain for 11, or year, 11 years or more. So defying uh, Kumar's uh, evidence and showing that the longer patients wait to get a spinal cord stimulator, the worse they perform. And then these are patients on ODIs that were rated as severely disabled or crippled. So these were very much real patients. And then this is what we're gonna be looking at. Now, just as it pertains to 24 month data, I wanna kind of keep everybody's uh, uh, attention um, you know, framed on that. This is not just one year data where everything we know performs great at three months and then it kind of hangs around at 12 months, we're going beyond that. And eventually we're gonna be presenting the 36 month data, which has never been done before. So if you look here, we have uh, some really great improvements. 84% uh, responder rate, um, two, two out of three people were reducing their opioids, which is a really um, impressive uh, thing for our space to see uh, therapy perform that well. And then improvements in function, uh, we're gonna go into that, and then sleep and mood, and then just overall quality of life. But we're gonna focus in on these four in particular, um, as I think that these are probably gonna be the most salient for anybody that's using this therapy. So responder rate. Um, it's kind of fitting that uh, Nagy McHale was the first author in the study because he was the one that coined uh, the phrase I think so many of us know, the 50-50 club, where 50% of patients will get 50% or more pain relief. So that was basically what we took a responder at for this study was the 50% or more. So we were well beyond the 50% of the performing of that. At the time, the best was uh, Senza, which, perform, uh, which reported a 76.5% responder rate. This beat that. So this was 84%. So now we've kind of set the bar again. And then looking at the unicorns, which would be the high responders or 80%, that was 50% for us. So what would be kind of 50% for anybody getting a spinal cord stimulator? They're 50% just to get a high, um, become a high responder. So it's one in two patients. You can look at them and tell them that you're going to get up above 80% relief, which is something we would never be able to say with people um, to patients with a straight phase previously to that. And then opioids. So anyone who knows me um, knows that this is something that was uh, near and dear to me. My mother was a prescription drug addict. So opioids are something that are particularly disgusting to me. Um, the ability to get two out of three patients off of them at two years uh, with a spinal cord stimulator, that's something we've never seen before. The closest to that was the 12-month data, which was presented in Senza, which at the time was very, very impressive at 35%, you know, a little over a third. This is something now you can tell your patients that there's one in two chance you're gonna be uh, respond to this, 84% chance you're gonna be a high responder, and then two out of three chance I'm gonna get you off your opioids. So, so far, this is a pretty different comparison to, or it's a different way we've had to frame this therapy than we've ever had before, because now we're having to, instead of being vague, we're gonna be very specific with some really good improvements. And then looking at um, improvement in function. So for those of you that don't know what the Oswestry disability is, it rates people um, in 20 point increments. So zero to 20, 21 to 40, and it goes all the way up based on like low disability, um, severely crippled, and outright bed bound. When you look at this, the average was a 26 point reduction, which means that that's an entire class that the patient is changing. So if they were severely bed, or if they were bed bound, now they're severely crippled, going from zero, severely crippled to disabled. So patients are not just reporting better, getting off their opioids, but they're becoming more functional. They're doing better. If they were bed bound, they're out of bed now. If they were disabled, they're less disabled. 
and we showed 82% um, um, of these patients reported significant improvements. Going at sleep, a lot of these patients, we know that we're prescribing them uh, concomitant prescriptions for um, Xanax or Ambien, things like that to help them sleep because they're still waking up because of their, not just their pain, but also just their inability to move like they would want to. So we're showing that these patients actually got 1.2 hours of sleep additional, um, which equates to 54 nights of uh, sleep additional per year. Again, this is something that was never studied out to 24 months. The best we can compare it to was uh, the 12 month data, which was Senza, which was 2.6. And then time in the therapeutic window. So Eric did a really good, Erica did a really good job of describing what this is and um, what the therapeutic window is and how that works. When you look at these patients, um, the term that I heard used for it was titrating to failure, which is actually very apropos because patients are just continually turning um, these traditional therapies down because they keep moving, they keep feeling increased uh, stimulation and they just keep moving it down and down and down until you've effectively taken the Tylenol out of the Tylenol, they're out of the therapeutic window. Well, with closed loop, that never really is a problem because it's always adjusting itself. So the patient never has to actually reach for the programmer to change the level of stimulation. The, this device is doing it for them. So as a result, they're staying in the therapeutic window 94% of the time out to two years. Whereas um, this is something that we would never expect to see. So the, the device actually learned over time, it continued to get better, and the time in the therapeutic window seemed to just kind of stay right there in the optimal range. And then lastly, how does this perform in real world? Um, admittedly, when I first saw that flag at the bottom of the US, I didn't actually know what that was. That's the Netherlands. Um, and comparing how this does in a clinical trial is fantastic, but how does it perform in real life? So were these patients cherry-picked? Was it just a really controlled environment? Well, what we're showing is, is that 84% responder rate actually holds true in real world data not just inside the U.S. So this is outside the U.S. So we're seeing um, this isn't something that was just uh, framed really well in a study and is not reproducible. This is things that we're seeing that can be steadily reproduced. Um, high responders getting patients off their opioids. These are things that we're seeing out to two years. And we're looking forward to what it's going to show at the 36-month data and kind of keep going from there. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Stephen Falowski. All right, well, thank you uh, very much, Corey. Uh, I think you did a great job talking about the, the, the clinical evidence and, and the strong data that we have uh, with the Saluda uh, Evoke study. And it's quite impressive that we've now pulled this data out to 24 months, and we intend on pulling uh, and following these patients out to 36 months, which will be uh, obviously the landmark in, in our space for some data and time of data that we've uh, never actually had before. And some of these no numbers are, are, are quite astonishing. And it's really set the bar now that uh, there is no other therapy that's ever going to be able to prove superiority uh, over this therapy with ECAPS based on the fact of the high numbers of success and responder rates that we've seen. Um, what I'm going to try to also do now is build off of uh, what Dr. Peterson did a great job of, of describing, like looking at the, the science and, and how this, this works. Uh, and why it's important. Uh, but what I'm going to try to do is build off of not only why it's important, but how, how is it individualized to each patient? And why is it important for each patient to have the ability to measure an ECAP and to adjust in, in real time? Not just measure and evoke compound action potential or a version of it, but be able to actually adjust in real time based on that uh, to keep the patient uh, in, in a therapeutic uh, frame or therapeutic window where the device can continue to work. Okay, so this is now uh, basically looking at this idea of why do you need an, an ECAP? And what this is, is the ability to adjust in, in real time for the changes we have in, from the distance of the spinal cord from the electrode. Uh, it's quite interesting, actually, when you think about this, because we think about the epidural space and the CSF surrounding the spinal cord is very small. We're talking millimeters. Uh, even when we're at T8, T9, where the it's the largest CSF space, which is about six to eight millimeters. It seems still very small. But what's interesting is, is uh, Holsheimer uh, did a lot of work that demonstrated that for every half a millimeter that the electrode moves from the spinal cord, you can actually lose or gain 50% of the strength uh, of the activation coming from that. So you can imagine half a millimeter, less than the width of my fingernail, or half a millimeter, we're talking about a distance of eight millimeters of CSF space at the level of T8 or, or T9. Half a millimeter is a huge difference then 
uh, and what you would expect because when these, the electrode moves closer and farther away from the spinal cord, you now realize the extent to which the stimulation is actually going to change if it's changing by 50% every half millimeter. Now think about the different physical things you do throughout the day that's going to move that electrode. Uh, the big ones are obviously going from, say, sitting to, to lying down or to standing. But you also think about even movements like twisting your body, bending, uh, walking throughout the day, you're changing your posture. All these things are happening in real time throughout the day in your life that you normally don't think you would have to accommodate for. Now, previously with uh, traditional tonic therapy and, and spinal cord stimulation in general, uh, those positional changes would lead to huge effects for the patient where, especially when you had overstimulation, so say from standing to, to lying down, uh, you get that much closer to the spinal cord, the patients would receive jolts. And the first instinct when you receive a jolt is to turn the device down, which then makes it subtherapeutic and no longer effective for the patient. This is why we're now titrating from failure with this therapy because we're, we're fighting these positional changes that happen with the patient. Also think about just some of the physiological uh, changes in your body that occur throughout the day. You, your heart rate, uh, 60 to 80 beats uh, per minute. Uh, you're breathing throughout the day. Uh, you can cough, you can sneeze. Uh, think about just even physiological things such as like your hydration, which can control how much your heart is pumping or the degree to which your heart is pumping and your blood pressure. That all can lead to these half millimeter, one millimeter or more differences in where the electrode sits on the spinal cord which can lead to huge profound effects on the stimulation and whether or not it's working and whether or not it actually affects or even hurts the, the, the patient. So we, we now know with, with the both that with the clinical data that we've seen by measuring ECAPs and being able to adjust in, in real time, it's, it's keeping up with the dynamics of what's happening uh, with a patient, whether it's physical changes or physiological changes that occur during the day. Now let's kind of put this into perspective of what it means in an individual patient. So when we measure an ECAP, what we're doing is that's an evoked compound action potential. So it's actually a combination of action potentials that are recorded and, and summated uh, so that we can see it and understand what's happening in the spinal cord by stimulating it. Another way of looking at it is by calling that the neural activation because the factors are involved with the ECAP. The, the morphology of the ECAP tells you the, the amount of uh, neural fibers that are being activated, the, the width of the fibers that you're activating, and to what extent. And now that neural activation is actually different for each patient. So if you look at this graph, it's, it's a way of schematically showing you that with three different subjects, the neural activation or the ability to uh, activate the most ideal ECAP, uh, the dose to do that is dramatically different uh, with different patients. Here you can, you can see the dose extending from one uh, to 1.5 to even close to three uh, for patients to, uh, to basically stimulate a neural activation for that best ECAP. But even that neural activation is different for each patient. The degree to generate the same ECAP in one patient is not going to be the same dosage that it will be in another patient. This basically tells you that patients are very individualized. This is why it is very important to measure the ECAP uh, for these patients to measure what's actually happening in the spinal cord so you can understand what fibers are being activated, understand the degree of neural activation that is occurring that is completely different uh, for every patient. So here's another way of looking at it. So now we'll just take one subject and look at the neural activation. And we, we determine that the best ECAP or the ideal ECAP for this patient has a neural activation of around 30. As you can see here, which we write it as the prescribed target. This is what we want the patient to get, thinking that this is going to give them the best pain relief because this is the neural activation that we determine is the best for the patient. But what you can see here now, if you follow the dose curve on the, on the, the, uh, the x-axis, what you see is that even just by changing positions, the amount of dose that has to change even in this single patient is pretty dramatic to the point where it's even double at some points when the patient is standing compared to when they're lying down. This tells you the importance of not only is the neural activation different for each patient, but the ability and the dose that it takes to keep the patient at that exact neural activation can be dramatically different within the same patient, never mind actually over multiple patients. So it's important that if you want to prescribe the specific neural activation to generate the ideal ECAP for the most ideal pain relief, that you have to be able to change in real time and be dynamic the change with the, with the environment of where this electrode sits uh, on the spinal cord. 
Now here's putting it kind of in a, in a different schematic so you can uh, potentially have a little more understanding of how quickly things can change with those physical changes, those physiological changes that occur uh, within the body on just a, a moment to moment basis. So here's just an example of a patient from the study in the open loop portion, which means in the study, the open loop arm was patients who uh, had an ECAP that was measured, but then the closed loop portion, the ability to adjust in real time was not turned on on that treatment arm. What this actually shows you is when the patient goes from sitting and you have a, the prescribed neural activation or the ECAP that you uh, measure before uh, you know, basically placing the patient in the open loop but just not putting on the, the feedback mechanism, you can see that as soon as the patient leaned back, there was a five time increase in the amount of neural activation or fibers that you were activating in the spinal cord. This is the exact scenario in which a patient will say, I felt a jolt. Um, or it, the, the paresthesia just became too much, or uh, the, the stimulation caused super stimulation and maybe cramping. But look at how fast that this happens. Just from the patient sitting to lying back, it was a five times increase within one second. Um, now, you need to have a device that can adjust in real time. The, the Saluda device adjusts based on the frequency of the device. So if you're a program that's 60 hertz, the, the, the device is going to adjust 60 times per second. Now, always remember that this, this five times increase that happened when, from sitting to lying down happened in a one second period. So at the worst case scenario, that means the device basically could adjust in real time within one second. But you also have to remember where does that change actually occur based on to where is the device actually recording. So in general, in most times, the device is actually going to take care of the problem in less than a second uh, because it's, it basically can overlap on whether that degree of change is actually happening. In normal life, without a, a, an ECAP closed loop system, this is when the patients are going to reach for the controller to turn down the device because they were overstimulated. We know from previous studies that looking at this, that this patients will reach for their device sometimes greater than 30 times a day to adjust the stimulation because it's overstimulating them. And you can understand if you're getting overstimulated 30 times a day, your instinct is going to be to turn down that device to subtherapeutic levels where it's no longer working. Here's just another example of uh, that change that can happen in the, the neural activation. Uh, and you can see the rapid increase that can happen with a cough. So here what you see is in less than one second, just by having a cough, there was a six times increase in the amount of neural activation. Now keep in mind, this is not a six times increase in the dose or the amplitude or the pulse rate. This is the, the six times increase in the amount of nerve fibers and activation you're getting within the spinal cord. You have the ability to measure now the degree of uh, activation we have within the spinal cord. This is six times the prescribed activation that you would want within the spinal cord. That happens within less than a second. This is why uh, it is very important to be able to adjust for this, especially for overstimulation. And I think this is actually quite interesting. There's been several studies on this that uh, have actually shown that the conduction velocity within nerve fibers decreases with age. Uh, so what that means is your nervous system is, is slowing down with age. A lot of that could be loss of uh, myelin over time. A lot of it just could be even loss of nerve fibers over time, lack of using certain nerve fibers over time. But we do know that the conduction velocity of nerve fibers decreases as you age. So as you can imagine, uh, if you have such a, a huge drop of 20% decrease in the conduction velocity of your nerve fibers in less than a 20 year period of your life, you can imagine how quickly this is actually even happening on a yearly basis for a patient. That means the degree of activation or neural activation changes uh, that quickly in, in a patient. And that's why you need a system like this if you're going to have longevity with these devices that can continuously adjust to wanting to have a very specific ECAP and a very specific amount of neural activation. It now adjusts for the fact that because we know what's happening at the spinal cord level, at the nerve fiber level, we can adjust for things like a conduction velocity that's changing with an aging patient. Here's actually something that I find quite interesting, and, and over time we're actually starting to build more data on this, is that some of the medications that we are on affect the way spinal cord stimulation uh, will work. And what that means by that is that there are certain medications uh, that basically increase the threshold of firing. So it makes it harder uh, to activate the nervous uh, system, or harder to activate those nerval uh, fibers, harder to get that neural activation that you want. 
But what that means is it also extends open the therapeutic window. So here's an example of the patient on gabapentin on the left side of the graph, where being on gabapentin basically increased the thresholds. So what that means is it takes more stimulation or it's harder to stimulate a certain amount of neural fibers to generate an ECAT. But what that also means is the therapeutic window, the window where you can go from low stimulation to very high stimulation and still have a therapeutic effect is actually quite large. But what you see here is actually, if you take it all the way to the right side of the graph where the patient now is no longer on gabapentin, uh, a neuroleptic medication, and no longer on uh, oxycodone or oxycontin or any of the narcotics, what you can see is the neural activation drops down, which means now the thresholds drop down to a lower level. It's easier to activate those nerve fibers. Because it's easier to activate those nerve fibers, you can now see that the therapeutic window, the window of where it goes from uh, lowest amount of stimulation to do it and highest amount of stimulation to do it and keep them therapeutic, that therapeutic window has now actually shrunk. This tells you the importance of constantly being able to measure an ECAP to constantly keep a patient in what a prescribed therapeutic window is because it is constantly changing. So we're seeing that it changes with conduction and velocity with age, but we're also seeing as it changes even just with the dosing of medication that you're on. And we consistently in our practice are changing the dosage of medication for these patients. We're consistently changing the medications that these patients are on. And what this shows you is the dramatic effect it actually has that happens on the neural activation of the nerve fibers within the spinal cord. This is why it is so important to be able to record in real time what is actually happening at the nerve level, at the spinal cord level, which is something we have never done uh, before. And this is something that has been very much lacking uh, in spinal cord stimulation and neuromodulation. This is obviously the, the future of what we're going to do because this demonstrates the importance of why we need to understand what is actually happening at the spinal cord when we stimulate. So when you think about how it does this consistently, how does it keep it in a therapeutic window? Dr. Peterson talked a lot about the, the, the loop, the closed loop that's actually occurring where we want to have a consistent activation at the nerve level, the spinal cord level. So we're constantly measuring the ECAP. And if we realize if the ECAP changes, we then quickly change the stimulation on the same frequency that the device is set, whether it's 60 hertz or up to 100 hertz or 100 times per second, the, the device can adjust in real time to give you the same consistent neural activation within the, the spinal cord. This is why during the study, with the closed loop arm, we saw that those patients were kept in the therapeutic window, meaning the prescribed neural activation. They were kept there 94% of the time. Uh, so it's no surprise that we have the responder rates, uh, especially high responder rates that we see uh, in, the, in the closed loop arm. So at this point, I, I'm going to pass it back to, to Dr. Gear. I think he's going to moderate some questions as well as bring on our other panelists. Well, Steve, a great job as always. You know, I think a lot of questions that came to mind as you talked and as Erica and Corey talked. So let me just let's get right into it. We're going to stay, we're going to stay right on time. We're going to be finished with this uh, discussion in 20 minutes, but we have some a little time to talk. And my first question is, and I think actually, uh, Stephen, this is going to be for you, and that is, what do we think happens between the measurement of the nervous system and the response? Because I, I noticed in the studies. Measuring alone seems to improve outcomes, even compared to some of the, the more sophisticated studies out there. So is it the measurement or the response or both that's important? Yeah, that's a great question, Tim, because uh, it's when you look at the, the, the Evoke study, what you see is the two treatment arms. One was closed loop and one was open loop. The open loop arm had actually some of the best data we have ever seen for especially traditional tonic parameters in spinal cord stimulation. The one factor that was involved there was with the open loop arm, they actually did the initial programming based on producing the ideal ECAP. The difference is, is that they didn't turn on the closed loop system to ensure that the patient always had the best ECAP. So what that shows you is that even just by programming to an ECAP, programming to what the ideal neural activation is in the spinal cord, patients can do better than what we've seen before. But the importance is in keeping them at that same ECAP, that same neural activation, that's why the closed loop is so important. So I think the importance is in both of them. It's one thing to measure an ECAP, which can elevate the efficacy we have, but it can only get you so far if you can't continue to give that same ECAP. So that's why you need to have a true closed loop system that's constantly monitoring. No, no, great, great response. Uh, Eric, I'm gonna come to you next. And you know, you talked about the science a, a bit, which you know, you've been great at. 
I know we had an accelerometer. Dave Stoltz published a, a study a long time ago on accelerometers and did a great job. And you know, we also have had uh, other uh, devices that said they can measure a feedback, but really it's not responding to the feedback on uh, multiple times a second, as you pointed out. What's the major difference between this system and things that have been talked about, like accelerometers or uh, some rudimentary uh, non-FDA approved closed loop systems? Yeah, so, so you know, we've been struggling to try to come up with some sort of objective way to adjust around these um, positionality, as we called it, and that was the main thing an accelerometer was going to address. One of the, the issues with this is that now we actually are looking more at a biomarker than we are at some sort of external proxy. And so um, there's been a quest for a long time to say, what can we measure that's actually some sort of a physiological mar marker of outcome success. And so I would argue that this is a great first step. I actually see that we are potentially in the next decade going to see actually maybe an additive component of not just ECAP, but some other biomarkers added in a way that actually allows even further individualization of benefit. And as our computer processors get faster, as we're able to put more of that into an implanted device and have the AI and the math that's necessary to make those really complex adjustments, now we'll be able to even incorporate more things. Perhaps there's something about the uh, neurochemical components, um, composition of CSF that we don't know yet uh, that we'll be able to detect, for example. But until we come up with what that overall complicated formula might be, having something that's objectively looking at electrical activity of the nervous system, which is what we're trying to treat with an electrical stimulus, is a leap far beyond the proxy of these delayed indicators of behavior uh, that we've had access to up to this point. You know, wonderful thoughts. You know, I've been working with Kaz Elmerdafan and others on, on biomarkers recently, even in the urine, and maybe we can tie all that together down the road. I love that thought, because then we could actually see what the nervous system is doing. So I think that could be very, is the future, just how we tie it together, we'll have to figure that out. Corey, you know, I, I loved your talk and, and I thought you made a lot of great points. You talked about study design. And I know you've really thought a lot about study design and, you know, we've had some great studies out there, Accurate, Sunburst, Senza, you know, but this one is unique. Why is it unique? What, what do you think the unique uh, parameters are of this study, Evoke, published in both JAMA Neurology and, you know, Lancet Neurology? What's, what made it so impactful that it got published in those journals? Well, a couple of things. I mean, the I think just the sheer concept of it is what lended itself to get published into, you know, like a, a journal like Lancet. Is this something that even as a lay person can kind of see that, you know, wow, this is actually measuring potentials. It's real time stimulation. So this is something that that's actually special. Um, and so far as like the study design, I don't know if like people can truly appreciate the like the double blind concept of it. That's something that people you know, I think we take for granted when you have a drug, it's easy to do a placebo and you do the, the, the two drugs can look exactly the same. In pain management, like spinal cord stimulation, it's really hard to tell um, the person either they got, if they got it or they didn't get it. If you look at the Senza study patients, you know, they, when they were consented, they're, you know, they know that they're going to get a, a either a plus, um, the uh, standard, which is uh, tonic stimulation or something that, that um, is supposed to be better and they may not feel it. So they knew which one they were getting. Um, with this, there's, you know, we didn't know, um, the patients didn't know, they wouldn't even let us in the room. So there's like any concept of bias was completely eliminated. So I think that just, you know, people looking at studies and reading data, um, that's something that's really special for this study because it was really truly like just studying the patient's response. There was no cues. There was no any way to kind of do the leads differently. Um, the programming, the engineering, everything is done exactly the same way. And then it was just a very perfectly designed study. And then the data that we that came out of it, it just, it continued to perform. Um, so you're measuring like all these variables. And then instead of just seeing like, oh, well, we're just going to report on these because these worked and not these other ones didn't, everything was reported. So reporting beyond just pain scores, we're reporting into things like opioids because it did perform well. You know, and not to say that other um, studies have not, um, you know, released that data because it didn't perform well. I'm not saying that at all. But, you know, if you're showing that like two out of three people are coming off opioids at two, at, like at two years, that's so impactful. And again, there's no bias with that either. So you have to take this at face value. No, I, I think to me that was, I agree with everything you said. That is the uniqueness of it. I have, I have one more question for each of you. 
and then we're going to finish up with the overall question. Stephen, this is for you. Um, you showed two slides that really are impactful, in my opinion. You showed many that were impactful. Two really left me with the impression: old people don't re their nervous system doesn't respond as well. So this may be very important for them to make sure we're getting in that zone in that therapeutic window. That's not my question, though. I thought that was an interesting observation. Should we get everybody off opioids and gabapentin before we put a stimulator in them? Because look at that therapeutic window shrinking. When they were on less drugs, they did much better, it seemed. What, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, well, it's interesting because what we see is that when they weren't on medica medication, their therapeutic window shrunk down. Um, what, I, I, what I take from that is it's not so much that we have to get them completely off the, these medications, but just knowing that these medications actually change the way they react to spinal cord stim. Um, I think the, the best way to look at it is even something like gabapentin and neuroleptic. What it actually shows in the data that we have from that looking at ECAPS and therapeutic window with these patients is being on a neuroleptic like that actually increases the threshold to stim. So it requires, the best way to think about it in simplest terms is it requires more stimulation to actually get those patients to respond. And if you think about it, if they're constantly changing their dose, they're on the medication, they're off the medication, that means the degree of stimulation is constantly changing. Um, so, I mean, we know from data that obviously decreasing opioids or having patients on less opioids with spinal cord stims, the patients generally do better. Um, but we also have to put this in real practice in the sense that we may not be able to get all these patients off completely of opioids and neuroleptics before the stimulator is put in. But what that shows you is the importance of then needing a stimulator that one, can measure what's actually happening and two, change and adjust to the fact that their neural activation changes based on the dosing of medication that they're on. You know, great, great thoughts. I agree with it. Again, I haven't disagreed with any of you yet, which is unusual for me. So, uh, so <laughs> great answers. Erica, this is really, I think, important question for the future. Um, I know there'll be new waveforms developed by Saluto for this device. And, you know, you've done a lot of work on paraseizure-free systems and you've published on it and you've been, uh, I think you'll be leading some discussions at Aspen this year. Um, you know, paraseizure, most of those systems don't measure anything. They just, you put the leads in a certain spot and you, turn it on and there you go. Um, what's the future of paraseizure free systems if we find that over time they lose their effect, we can't measure to recapture those. You think every system will have to go to some form of, of closed loop feedback like, like this system or, or what's the future there of, of those systems with this type of technology available? You know, um, I changed the generator for a patient who had his stimulator placed in 1998 a week ago, and he's got four contacts at T10, and it's amazing that um, he still has benefit um, over all that time. And yes, he's connected to the most modern generator now available, um, but frankly, he's not accessing. He's staying with what's been consistent over time. So I think that there that what we're aiming for is a way to get to optimized, individualized benefit for patients in the same way that we've seen the revolution in cancer care to having specific gene-driven uh, cancer treatments for tumors. I think we're going to get to a place where we're going to be able to individualize and optimize and select much better what we do with neurostimulation for a patient's specific pain condition, figure out what that pain signature is and how to optimize and get that person to respond. What that means is that we need to open the doors to a lot of options. And I do think that recording and understanding what kind of response, regardless of waveform, may be part of that in the future, certainly. But there will be some people who were going to be able to benefit using an older technology. And so I wouldn't abandon everything that's, that, that we've already seen benefit with. Patients who've done well, I, I tell my patients, you don't need a Lamborghini to get to the grocery store if the Model T is working. Uh, and so there's a, there's a great conservatism. There's something that to me is to be thought about in terms of what this is going to look like in terms of cost efficacy and health quality related uh, measures as well where we may find that the pressures on this are going to be economic as much as anything else. And so there's a lot to look into. It's going to be a very vibrant discussion over the next several years. No, gr great thoughts. You know, I, I, I think I agree with part of what you said. I, I think we, we, the longevity is what I'm really interested in to see if we can recapture people as they lose something. And that's really interesting. And I think as I think about Twitter, I'm thinking more of the Tesla and Lamborghini now. 
But uh, Corey, well, you're uh, looking for a little disagreement, so there you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'm not quite sure. I agree with you on that, but we, we, that's you're not going to debate that in Miami, hopefully. Um, Corey, here's here's a question for you. This is the last question for you. Then I have one final question for everyone to answer together. Um, you know, the question is from one of the audience members. You know, it's a lot of, a lot's going on here. What type of what are the parameters of these devices? You know, like what's some average you know pulse width, energy requirements, you know, longevity of the device. What, what are we expecting to see? Does it take a lot of energy to do all this measurement? And what type of, you know, what type of parameters we expect to see in clinical practice? I mean, I think this is going to be like an incredibly energy efficient device because it's never, um, you know, it's, you're never, it's never overstimulated. It's never overstimulated. And it's going to be in that Goldilocks zone. So when you traditionally look at things like, uh, you know, things that are going to be using a lot of energy, they have to be charged, you know, no matter how functional the waveform is or how, you know, um, you know, effective the therapy is, it's going to be really energy draining. You look at other things that are, you know, there's not a lot of CSF, something like DRG or something, you know, like another waveform that's very energy efficient, that's going to be a lot less drain on the battery, but it's still going to be static over time. This device will never have to overstimulate, um, you know, wherever they kind of set the therapeutic window where it's based on the patient, the prescribed levels, the device doesn't have to overachieve to get there. And it's never going to underachieve to the point where the patient's going to, like we said, titrate to failure. So the, I think the, you know, just the pulse widths and the things of that nature are going to be kind of set, but we're talking about the amplitude, which is going to be the direct drain on the energy. So it's going to stay right where it needs to be. And, you know, as a result, we're going to see these batteries um, that are going to come out of this therapy that are going to be able to last like a really long time. And you're going to be able to get this impressive pain relief, but the device is just going to stay exactly where it needs to because it can analyze what it's doing. So as a function of it, the functionality just becomes that much more, like I said, just efficient. So, you know, I must say that the questions are pouring in and we're, we're going to run out of time. So we may, maybe we'll have to do another one of these in a month or two as we get more experience in the clinical uh, realm in America, because I, I don't have enough time for all these questions. I'm, so I'm going to read you a comment. And I want each of you to comment on what I'm going to read. Can you tell me this is uh, correct or incorrect for this device? And I'll start with Stephen, and you can put your own thoughts on this, and we'll, we'll go to Erica, and then we'll go to Corey to finish up, and I'll give a final thought. The, the statement is, is it incorrect to say that ECAP is a unique patient signature that determines their dose on a second-by-second second basis? Is it a unique patient signature? So, Stephen, I'll start with you. What's your thoughts on that on that quote? It is, it is absolutely because it changes with, with each patient. Um, what you're doing is you're trying to generate an ideal ECAP, which the morphology is going to look the same once you generate that across different patients. But what it takes to get there and generate that morphology is going to be different for every patient. So it is actually uh, very individualized and very important to, to do. And to, to what the build off of what uh, Corey was actually talking about with the keeping them in like this therapeutic window where they're not over under stimulating and building an efficient system. Um, these systems actually, they know from the, the Evoke study as well as uh, modeling based on the stimulation parameters that these patients are, all, because of the efficiency, they're only charging one time a week. So it's actually not taking a lot of energy to even run this feedback or closed loop system. But we understand the importance of it because it's individualized to each patient. Yeah, what I love about what you just said is, you know, knowing this happens every milliseconds, right? So many times per second. We can person can change in a, in, a, in a millisecond. You know, something different can happen to you. Change your position, you breathe, you cough. You know, in a millisecond, your body can change. So I do like that. Uh, Erica, this, you know, you heard the, the statement I read. You know, is it incorrect to say that it's a unique patient signature uh, determines the dose on a millisecond basis? Is that is that correct? And what I would you add to that or subtract? Or is that just perfect? I, I I would agree with Stephen's answer on that. So Stephen and I both have recorded intraop matter sensory evoke potentials and looked at EMG activation with all of our implants for what a decade now, Stephen. And so and so what we see is that pattern is replicating. And so I've really enjoyed right now doing our intraoperative neuromonitoring and seeing what I see in those act and those tracings and how that correlates with when the ECAP comes in. And it's different from patient to patient, what amplitude we're at um, and, and exactly what we see in terms of the pattern, depending on what, what active anodes and cathodes we're using. Um, and it is very individual, but that, inter that interesting overlap between what I know the patient is gonna take forward and what I'm going to get to see recorded off of the device that's permanently implanted and how that correlates to our interoperative recordings has been an interesting illustration. 
No, great, great thoughts. Uh, you and Steven are both so young, it's hard to believe it's been a decade, but you know, that's how it goes, time flies. Corey, I'm gonna ask you a different question. You're the last question of the night, and it's a little bit different because I, I think it's kind of an important question. And that is, we had a group of fellows, you, know, you and I have taught a lot of fellows courses together over the years, and they trained somewhere where there was only one device used, and it was an older device, and they'd never been exposed to this system. And you had to, within, in a few sentences, explain to them why this may be the, you know, the future of the field in a lot of ways, what would you say? Um, I mean, I guess it's the same as trying to, um, you know, the answer I was going to give before the, um, you know, talking about the waveform, I guess I'll try to give the same analogy. You know, it's going to be as individual as someone's, you know, EKG and you're kind of the understanding of the, of, and then just using that analogy in this space, we've always kind of taken this EKG of the spinal cord for granted. We're just stimulating blindly. So, for someone to kind of you know go into a therapy now knowing that there's the ability to actually you know do it effectively like in a feedback and knowing as like you know exactly what the like the health of the cord and whatever else is doing to not have exposure to that i think one thing you're kind of selling yourself short if you're really just doing one type of stimulation but to not see this and not now know, understand like the neurophysiology and everything that's going on but more importantly all the science is going to come off this now um, you know, I firmly believe that this is like we're seeing now, like the development of, you know, an entire new therapy, like the same way, you know, interventional cardiology, the EKG changed the field of cardiology and then eventually led itself to like electrophysiology and EP, like a whole new field. I, I really do feel that like this is going to breed an entire new specialty, um, the ability now to kind of understand this and the utility of what we can do with this, you know, just looking at something like an opioid and you know, um, neuroleptic and how that changes the therapeutic window. Um, you know, is that the reason why that this has been failing in a lot of people that are on opioids, but this is going to create a whole not, a lot more questions, I think, than it will answers. So not to be exposed to this, I think in, um, in a fellowship training, you're really denying yourself, I guess, the, like the science and the breakthrough of what we're seeing with this therapy and not really kind of understanding the field for where it's, you know, this is the jumping off point now. Um, we're going to be able to really kind of, you know, better analyze, you know, things that we're doing. Do epidurals work? You know, we can do that now. We can actually look and see what that does in vivo, not just, you know, looking in cadavers or doing it in animals. Like you can actually see it now. So, you know, uh, people have said that, you know, getting people off opioids, they do better in spinal cord stimulation. And I think we all thought it was just, well, yeah, because opioids are messy and the patient, you know, just isn't going to perform well because they're drug seeking. Now we're kind of seeing that that really wasn't the case. That was because the patient was probably outside the therapeutic window. But that's a conversation you're not going to be able to have if you're not exposed to this therapy. So I'd really like encourage people to seek this out if you're in training. No, great, great thoughts. So we have about a minute left. I'm going to finish with just a couple of thoughts. So the, I know Selvery didn't get your questions answered. We had a large crowd tonight and uh, no one left. We, we kept everyone throughout the whole uh, discussion, which I think is great that you obviously it's an interesting topic. You will receive a survey after the webinar. So if you have questions we didn't get to tonight, please put those in that survey and then they'll get that to one of our faculty members and we'll try to answer your question uh, later on. So we will get back to you, Warren Noria. Uh, you know, obviously, here's an article I wrote along with colleagues uh, John Hagedorn, and Jessica Jamison, and Nagy McKell. And really, we said without objective measures, and we talked about this tonight, we really can't understand what the court is doing. And I think that's really. What we're seeing here in the, the title of the article was a new horizon. And I think this is going to be something so so different that our, our, our longevity of outcomes, hopefully in the real world, will be shown to be persistent. And that's what it's all about, right? Having less explants, more uh, improvements, and more quality of life, and changing people's lives for the better, improving patient safety and efficacy. Uh, and then the last slide, uh, I'll just remind you that uh, you know we talked about tonight, you know, really amazing elevated clinical evidence which helps the whole field, advancing the experience for the patient. You know, some of the things that Dr. Peterson talked about, no need to be reprogrammed in many cases over a year, uh, no explants at two years in the study, and the fact that it's real timing and really a patient signature, if you will, it's gonna revolutionize the science of neuromodulation and the outcomes. Next slide, please. And I would invite you to attend our next webinar. And again, based on tonight, we may need another one on this topic because of the interest and the level of questions in the scientific area. Um, please join us in Miami, July 14th through the 17th. Um, we're going to have a cadaver lab on Thursday uh, covering uh, all the minimally invasive techniques you're seeing, including spinal cord stimulation, but also including a lot of spine techniques. We have great science on Friday and Saturday and Sunday, including a lot of uh, original scientific research. We'll have 
over 20 presentations alone just on original scientific research and then our panel format we often discuss so with that i want to thank you stephen corey erica for joining me tonight i think the discussion has been wonderful and thank all of you for joining us and we'll see you hopefully in miami in july good night everybody <music>